Chapter Twelve of What the White Race May Learn from the Indian by George Wharton James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve The Indian and Hospitality. Another of the things I think we might well learn from the Indian is his kind of hospitality. Too often in our so called civilization, hospitality degenerates into a kind of extravagant, wasteful, injurious ostentation. I do not object, on formal occasions, to ceremonial hospitality, to an elaborate spread and all that goes with it. But in our everyday homes, when our friends call upon us for a meal or a visit of a week, it is not true hospitality to let them feel that we are overworking ourselves in order to overfeed and entertain them. When one has plenty of servants, the overwork may perhaps not be felt, but the preparation and presentation of extra fine meals should be looked upon as an unmitigated evil that ought to cease. Why is it that the professional lecturers, singers, and public performers generally refuse to accept such hospitalities? Every one doing their kind of work knows the reason. It is because this high feeding unfits them for the right discharge of their duties. To overfeed a preacher, and I've been a preacher for many years, is to prevent the easy flow of his thought. It is as true now as when Wordsworth wrote it that plain living and high thinking go together. For the past five weeks I have been lecturing nightly in New York City. I am often invited to dinners and banquets, but I invariably refuse unless I am promised that a full supply of fruit, nuts, celery, and bread and butter or foods of that nature are provided for me and that I am not even asked to eat anything else. I don't even want the mental effort of being compelled to refuse to eat what I know will render my brain logy, heavy, and dull. Then again, when I am invited to a home where no servants are kept, as I often am, and see the hostess worrying and wearying herself to prepare a great variety of dainties and fine foods for me, that I know I am far better without, what kind of creature am I if I can accept such hospitality with equanimity? I go to see people to enjoy them, their kindness, their intellectual converse, the home-likeliness of themselves and their children. If I want to stuff and gorge, I can do so at any first-class restaurant on the expenditure of a certain sum of money but at the homes of my friends I want them. I go for social intercourse, and to see them working and slaving to give me food that is an injury to me is not, never can be, my idea of hospitality. I would not have my readers infer from this that I am unmindful of the kindly spirit of hospitality behind all this needless preparation nor would I have them think that I never eat luxurious things. I am afraid some of my readers would forego their kind thoughts toward me if they were to see me sometimes as I indulge in all kinds of things that ordinary people eat. But I do want to protest against the ostentatious and extravagant manifestation of our hospitality, and also the injuriousness of much of it when it comes to the food question and to commend the spirit and method of the Indian's way. If friends come unexpectedly to an Indian home, they are expected to make themselves at home. They are not invited to the festive board to eat, but they are expected to share in the meal as a matter of course. Hospitality is not a thing of invitation, whim, or caprice. It is the daily expression of their lives. Every one, friend or stranger, coming to their camp at meal times is for the time being a member of the family. There is no display, no ostentation, no show, no extra preparation. You are one of us. Come and partake of what there is, is the spirit they manifest. 
there is nothing more beautiful to me than to find myself at a navajo hogan in the heart of the painted desert and to realize that i am expected to sit down and eat of the frugal meal which the family has prepared for itself my contention is that this is the true spirit of hospitality you are made to feel at home you are one of the family formality is dispensed with you are welcomed heartily and sincerely and made to feel at ease this is to be at home this is the friendly the human the humane thing to do unnecessary work is avoided the visitor is not distressed by seeing his hostess made to do a lot of extra cooking and fussing on his account his heart is warmed by the friendliness displayed and surely that is far better than merely to have his stomach filled and furthermore if he be a thoughtful man who values health and vigor rather than the gratification of his appetite he is saved the mortification and the annoyance of having to choose between the risk of offending his hostess by refusing to eat the luxurious obnoxities she has provided or offending himself by eating them under protest and possibly suffering from them afterward i was once visiting the mojave reservation at parker on the colorado river it was a very hot day and i was thirsty weary and hot as soon as i arrived at the home of one old lady she at once went out of doors to her wooden mortar took some mesquite beans pounded them poured water over the flour thus made and in a few minutes presented me with a copious drink that was both pleasing to the taste and refreshing look at her face as she kneels before the mortar it is a kindly and generous face she cared nothing for the fact that it was hot or that it was hard work to lift the pounder and make the meal for the drink she did it so simply and easily and naturally that i accepted the drink with the added pleasure that it was the product of a real and not an artificial hospitality few visitors to the snake dance and the different religious or thanksgiving festivals of the indians of the southwest have failed to observe the great amount of preparation that goes on for expected but unknown guests it is known they will come therefore preparations must be made for them corn is ground in the matatis and piki is made an old navajo indian pictured on the first page is a wonderful illustration of the natural generosity of the aborigine before he is spoiled by contact with the white many years ago this man who had large possessions of stock sheep horses and goats with much grazing land and several fine springs was riding on the plateau opposite where the pariah creek empties into the colorado river suddenly he heard shouts and screams and rushing down to the water saw a raft filled with men women and children dashing down the river to the rapids when the raft and its human freight were overturned into the icy waters he did not hesitate because the people were of a different color from his own but plunging in he rescued all those who were unable to save themselves mainly by his own valor it turned out that the strangers were a band of mormons seeking a new home in arizona and being met by the barrier of the colorado river had sought to cross it with their worldly goods upon the insecure and unsafe raft what could they now do though their lives were saved their provisions were nearly all lost in the raging rapids of the turbulent and angry colorado bidding them be of good cheer this savage indian led them to one of his hogans where immediately he set his several wives for the navajos are polygamists to grinding corn and making large quantities of mush for the half-famished white strangers he thus fed them daily for months in the meantime he allowed them to plant crops he finding seed 
on his land, using for irrigation, therefore, water from his springs. But he had not given himself proper care after his icy bath. His legs became drawn up by rheumatism, and from that day to this he has been a constant sufferer from his exposure to the cold water of the river and his after-neglect caused by his eager desire to care for unknown strangers. The awful irony of the whole thing lies in the fact that, in spite of what he had done, the recipients of his pure, simple, beautiful hospitality could not, or did not, appreciate it. He was only an Indian. He had no rights. They were American citizens, white people, civilized people. Why should this Indian own or control all this fine land, all these flowering springs, all these growing crops? It was wrong, infamous, inappropriate. Therefore, to make matters right, these grateful, civilized Mormons stole from him the best part of his lands, and the largest of his springs, and for years laughed at his protests, until, finally, a white friend was raised up for him in a brave United States Army officer, now a general in the Philippines, I believe, who presented the case of the Indian to the courts fought it successfully, and lived to see the Indians' wrongs in some small measure righted. To this day the Indian is known as Old Musha, the name given to him by the people whom he befriended in their distress, because mush was the chief article of the diet that his hospitality provided for them. Truly did Shakespeare write, Blow, blow, thou winter wind! Thou art not so unkind as man's ingratitude. That Indians know how to be beautifully courteous to their guests, I have long experienced. I have eaten at banquets at Delmonico's and the Waldorf Astoria in New York, the Hotel Cecil in London, the Grand Hotel in Paris, and many and various hotels between the Touraine in Boston and the Palace of San Francisco, and the Hotel del Coronado. And I have seen more vulgarity and ill-breeding at these choice and elaborate banquets, more want of consideration, more selfishness, and more disgusting exhibitions of greediness and gluttony than I have seen in twenty-five years of close association with Indians. I was once expected to eat at an Indian chief's hawa, or house. The chief dish was corn, cut from the cob while in the milk, ground, and then made into a kind of soup or mush. A clean basketful was handed to me, with the intimation that I was to share it with two old Indians, one to my right, one to my left. I asked my hostess for a spoon for I knew I had seen one somewhere on one of my visits. She hunted for the spoon, in the meantime sending to the creek for an astua of fresh clean water. When it was brought, she carefully washed her hands, and then gave the spoon seven scrubbings and washings and rinsings before she handed it to me. I felt safer in using it than I do many a time at a city restaurant, when the culled brother brings me a spoon that he has wiped on the towel, which performs the multifarious duties of wiping the soiled table, the supposedly clean dishes, the waiter's sweaty hands, and, far oftener than people imagine, the waiter's sweaty face. During the time we were waiting for the spoon, the old Indians by my side sat as patiently and stoically as if they were not hungry. When the spoon was handed to me, I marked a half circle on the mush in front of me, in the basket, then divided the remainder for them. Each waited until I had eaten several mouthfuls before he inserted his own fingers, which served as his spoon, and then we democratically ate together. Now, to me, the whole affair showed a kindly consideration for my feelings that is not always apparent in so-called 
well-bred strangers of my own race. I've had many a man light a cigar or a cigarette at the table at which I've been compelled to sit in a restaurant with never a by your leave or is this agreeable. From the Indian we imagine that we ought not to expect much of what we call higher courtesy, yet I find it constantly exercised, while from the civilized white race we expect much and, alas, often are very much disappointed. It is a singular thing that while I am writing these pages about the lessons we may learn from the Indian, the Bishop of London, speaking in Trinity Church, New York, in September 1907, should enunciate ideas remarkably similar to those held by the Indians. The Indian owns nothing for himself. It belongs to all his tribe. What is this but the stewardship? In a rude and crude fashion, perhaps, but nevertheless stewardship, as declared by the bishop, who says, The one sentence which above all others I would say to you, a sentence as yet unheard in London and New York, and which, if adopted, would cleanse the life on both sides of the Atlantic, is, Life is a stewardship and not an ownership. Have you ever thought why there are any rich and poor at all? That is the question I had to face in London. They had asked me how I reconciled my belief in the good God loving all his children, with the wretched millions in East London seemingly abandoned by both God and man. I had to face that question, and I have had to face it ever since. There is but one answer. The rich minority have what they have merely in trust for all the others. Stewardship, non-ownership, is God's command to all of us. You are not your own. Nothing that you have is your own. We haven't learned the Christian religion if we have not learned the lesson of stewardship. My home has been the home of the Bishop of London for 1,300 years, Suppose I should say that it was my own, and that the bishop's income of fifty thousand dollars a year was my own. I would be called a madman. The man who thinks he owns what he has in his keeping is no less a madman. This applies alike to the boy and his pocket money, and the millionaire and his millions. Disregard of this trust is the cause of all the social evils of London and New York. To resume my experiences with the Indians. In September 1907, I again visited the Havusapai, and then had several wonderful illustrations of their real and genuine hospitality. We decided to camp below the home of an old friend of mine, Uta, as soon as our cavalcade of six persons on horses, mules, and burrows appeared with two pack-horses, he cordially welcomed us, and when I told him that we wished to camp below his awa, he took us into a fenced-in field where there were peach-trees and a corral for our animals. Here we were free from the intrusions of all stray animals, and were able to secure seclusion for the ladies of our party for, of course, we were camping out and sleeping in the open. Knowing that we should want plenty of water, both for ourselves and our animals, and that it was quite a little walk to Avasu Creek, he took his shovel, and in five minutes the limpid stream was flowing through the irrigation ditches close by. The peach tree over our heads, the best in the whole village, was placed at our disposal, and delicious indeed we found the fruit to be, and he sent us figs, beans, melons, and a cantaloupe. Without a question as to payment, he supplied us daily during our stay with an abundance of dried alfalfa hay, the fresh alfalfa not being good for our two civilized animals. And in every way possible to him, he sought to minister to our comfort and pleasure and did not resent it in the slightest when I bade him retire at meal-times, 
or while we were cooking our provisions. That we paid him abundantly when we left did not in the slightest alter the sweet character of his genuine and simple hospitality. Another illustration of the most beautiful kind of hospitality and courteous kindness was shown by an old Hopi Indian woman pictured. I was visiting the Hopi Pueblo of Walpi for the purpose of studying the secret ceremonies of the underground kivas of the antelope and snake clans prior to the snake dance. For fifteen days and nights I never took off my clothes to go to bed, but went from kiva to kiva, witnessing the ceremonials, and when I was too tired to remain awake longer, I would stretch out on the bare, solid rock floor, my camera or my canteen, for my pillow, and go to sleep. Occasionally, however, when something of minor importance was going on during the daytime, I would steal upstairs to a room which I had engaged in this woman's house. As soon as I stretched out and tried to sleep, she went around to the children and the neighbors and told them that the black bear, my name with these people, was trying to sleep and was very, very tired. That was all that was necessary to send the children far enough away so that the noise of their play could not disturb me and to quiet any unnecessary noise among their elders. This I take to be an extreme courtesy. I know people of both low and high degree in our civilization who resent as an impertinent interference with their rights any suggestions that they be kind or quiet to their neighbors, much less strangers and aliens. But for my own sake, I would far rather that my children possessed the kindly sympathy shown by these Indian children than have the finest education the greatest university of our civilization could grant without it. End of chapter 12「Thirteen of What the White Race May Learn from the Indian » by George Wharton James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13. The Indian and Certain Social Traits and Customs In the treatment of younger children by those who are older, the white race may learn much from the Indian. While it must be confessed that Indian youth are cruel to lower animals, I have never seen, in twenty-five years, an older child ill-treat a younger one. There seems to be an instinctive mothering of the little ones. The houses of the Hopis are built on the edges of frightful precipices, to fall from which would be sure and certain death. Yet, although the youngsters are allowed to play around with the greatest freedom, such are the care and constant oversight of the little ones by those who are older that I have never known of an accident. There seems to be none of that impatient petulance among the Indian children that is so common with us, no yelling or loud shouting, and certainly no bullying or cowardly domineering. Then, too, there is a very sweet and tender relationship existing quite often between the very old and the very young. I know this is not unusual or peculiar to the Indian, but I deem it worthy of note here. I have often seen a grandfather going off to his work for the day in a cornfield with his naked grandson on his back, and the youngster clung to the oldster with an affection and confidence that were absolute. It should also be observed that respect and reverence are nearly always paid to age. In a council the young men will invariably wait until the old men have spoken, unless they are definitely called upon. If a cigarette is offered to a young man in the presence of his elders, he will not enjoy it until the older ones have lit theirs and taken a few puffs. A girl or young maiden will not sit down until places are found for the older ones and they are comfortably seated, and, of course, the same rule applies to the boys and youths. 
it may also seem strange to some of my readers that i insist that the native indian is inherently honest i did not used to think so and i know of many dishonest indians but as a rule these are the ones that are partially civilized they have had so many things given to them without rhyme or reason that they come to regard all things of the white men as theirs scores of times i have left my wagon laden with provisions and other materials such as cameras camera plates clothes etc and i have been gone for a week or a month as i now write i can remember only twice that anything was taken once a young man who had been to our schools broke into a box of oranges that i had taken as a great luxury after a desert tramp and ate several of them i soon learned who the culprit was made complaint against him had him brought to my camp and asked him why he stole my oranges it must be remembered that it is an unwritten but well understood law of the desert regions that a truly hungry man is always allowed to help himself to needful food but without waste or extravagance and with due care for the owner or those who may come after this young man claimed that he had taken my oranges because he was hungry i gave him the lie direct for said i had you been hungry you would have been willing to eat meat and potatoes and bread instead of that you went prowling around until you smelled these oranges and then you stole them in future even if you are hungry you must keep away from my wagon and camp for if ever you touch my things again i shall see that you are severely punished it was a stern reprimand yet in this case it seemed to be necessary the other time that things were taken from me was when i had promised certain women and girls some calico and bead necklaces in return for something they had done for me foolishly i showed them the bag in which the calico was my hostess was also to be a participant in the distribution of favors while i was away on a several days exploring trip she took it into her head that she ought to have the first choice and as i had promised the piece to her there would be no harm in taking it when she had made her own choice and told of it of course she could not protest against the others making theirs so when i returned to my indian home i found the bag pretty well looted it was not long before little by little the whole story leaked out when i was sure i told my host and informed him that i wanted every piece of calico and every necklace returned instanter in twelve hours everything was back in place as if by magic then for several days i kept the promised recipients in a state for i intimated that their conduct was so reprehensible that i doubted whether i should give them anything or not this made them very anxious and when they dropped in two or three at a time i took the occasion to tell them how i resented their helping themselves to my things while i was absent with these two exceptions in twenty-five years experience i have met with nothing but perfect honesty no now i remember a small whip was taken from my camp many years ago but when i complained it was found and returned i have left camera plates by the score in boxes that could have been opened and the results of my months of labor destroyed by nothing but idle curiosity but when i have explained that i was going away and expected to find everything untouched on my return i had no fear no misgivings and invariably found everything in perfect order when i came back i doubt whether i could leave things where the whole population of any of our american cities could get at them and find them untouched after a week's or a month's absence 
Another interesting fact about the Indian is that when he gives a name to a child or an adult, it generally means something. Among ourselves, names are oftentimes either quite meaningless or senseless. For instance, my parents gave to me the name George. When I was old enough to begin to care about such things, I asked and found out that George means a husbandman. And all through my life I have borne that name, a husbandman, when my ignorance of agricultural pursuits, I am sorry to say, is simply dense and unspeakable. What is the sense of giving such names to children? And when we come to the Algernons and Reginas and Sigourneys and Fitzmorrises and all the high-sounding but altogether meaningless names with which we burden our children, I long for the simplicity of the Indian's habit, the poetry, the prayer, that so often are connected with the names they give. The old Hebrews knew something of this, for we read of many of their names having a definite and decided significance. One day I found a Chemawavy Indian with the name Toambo Isi Korum. After a little working of it out, I found the name signified the reddish golden pathway of glory made by the setting sun from the zenith to the horizon. I asked the man's mother how he came to have such a name, and here is her reply. As I gave birth to my son, I looked up in the heavens, and there I saw the golden reddish glory reaching from above where I lay to the faraway west, where the sun was just setting. So I said, It is an omen, and may it also be a prophecy. And my heart went out in prayer to those above that the pathway of life of my newly born son might be one of golden glory until he, too, passed out of sight in the west. So I called him Toambo e Sikorum, which signifies what I have said. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of What the White Race May Learn from the Indian by George Wharton James This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 the Indian and some luxuries. Most city men regard a shampoo as a city luxury of modern times, except, of course, for the rich, who could always have what they desire. Yet the shampoo is more common with some Indians than with us, and they enjoy it oftener than we do. The Indian's wife takes the root of the amole, macerates it, and then beats it up and down in a bowl of water until a most delicious and soft lather results, and then her liege lord stoops over the bowl and she shampoos his long hair and scalp with vigor, neatness, skill, and dispatch. I have been operated upon by the best adepts in London, Paris, and New York, and I truthfully affirm that a white man has much to learn in the way of skillful manipulation, effective rubbing of the scalp, and delicious silkiness of the hair, if he knows no other than such shampooing as I received. Another so-called luxury of our civilization is an everyday matter with the Indians of the Southwest. That is the Russo-Turkish bath. The first time I enjoyed this luxury with the Indians was on one of my visits to the Havasupai tribe. I had been received into membership in the tribe several years before, but had always felt a delicacy about asking to be invited to participate in this function. But one day I said to the old medicine man, as he was going down to Tahalwo, How is it that you have never invited me to go into Tahalwo with you? My question surprised him. He quickly answered, Why should I invite you to your own? The sweat bath is as much yours as it is mine. Then, said I, I will go with you now. 
the bathhouse consisted of a small willow frame some six or eight feet in diameter which at the time of using is covered with the navajo blankets etc to make it heat and steam proof a bed of clean willows was spread out for the sweaters to sit upon and a place left vacant for the red-hot rocks as soon as all was prepared i was invited to take my seat one indian followed on one side and the medicine man on the other then one of the outer indians handed in six or eight red-hot rocks and the flap of the cover was let down and the bath was fairly on directly the shaman began to sing a sacred song which recited the fact that tohorwa was a gift of the good god toshopa and was for the purpose of purifying the body from all evil as soon as the song ended we were all sweating freely but when the flap was opened it was not to let us out but to receive more hot rocks as we sang a second song the heat grew more penetrating so that the words seemed to have real meaning our petition was that the heat of tohowa might enter our eyes our ears our nostrils our mouths etc each organ being named at the end of the line of petition the song comprised a great long string of organs some of which i had never heard of before by this time sweat was pouring off from our bodies but the flap was opened only to receive more rocks at the third time a bowl of water was handed in to my companion which i was reaching for in order to enjoy a drink when to my horror and surprise he sprinkled the water over the red-hot rocks. The result was an instantaneous cloud of steam, which seemed to set my lips and nostrils on fire, and absolutely to choke me and prevent my breathing. Yet the two Indians began another song, so I determined to stick it out and stand it as long as I could. Of course, in a few moments, the intense heat of the steam was lost and then i was able to join in the song at its close the same process of steaming was repeated and then i sprang out and dived headlong into the cool not cold waters of the flowing havasu where for a long time i swam and enjoyed the delicious sensations with which my body was filled then after a rub down with clean clear clayey mud and another plunge i lay in the sun on a bed of willows listening to the indians tell stories and i can truthfully say i never felt so clean in my life this bath is taken by thousands of the southwest indians once a week as a matter of religion so that as a fact while their clothes are ragged and dirty and they themselves appear to be dirty they are really clean it must be confessed on the other hand that too many americans value the appearance of cleanliness more than the reality they would far rather appear clean even if they were not than be clean and appear dirty it is better to combine both reality and appearance but for my own sake if i had to choose between the two i believe i would rather be clean than only appear clean civilized man for centuries has used hot baths of various kinds for remedial and healing purposes throughout the world wherever hot springs are found men and women congregate in large numbers palatial hotels are built bathhouses established and an army of hotel keepers physicians nurses masseurs and bath operators organized some go to the baths just as they do any other fashionable thing or in order to mingle with the gay and fashionable throng other idlers go purely for the pleasure they gain from such associations while still others go for the health they long for the strength and vigor they have lost and there can be no question that they often gain it. 
in spite of the fashionable doctors who care less for the health of their patients than they do for their own fame and pockets in spite of the physical ills that come from the altogether inappropriate diet of the hotel dining rooms in spite of the excitement of balls and parties receptions and routs common at such places and in spite of the injurious influences of the gaming tables too often maintained the use of the waters is often beneficial to a number of the patients were they to use the waters rationally live hygienically avoid all stimulating foods and drinks and religiously refrain from all unnatural excitements there is no question but that the use of the hot waters the hot mud packs and the like would give health to many thousands who now derive but little benefit from them from whom did the white race learn the use of the hot bath the mud bath and the like he learned it from the indian and if he would study the present methods of the indians he would find many details connected with these baths that he might learn to his great advantage when the indian goes to the bath he makes of it an almost religious ceremony in one of the illustrations an old indian shaman is telling to the younger ones the things they should heed before going into the tahalwa or sweat bath the frame of which as yet uncovered is close at hand the hot waters that bubble out from the interior of the earth he regards as the special gifts of the gods he prays that he may not use these gifts unworthily just as the mohammedan believes that the desert is the garden of allah and that no one must walk in it who is sinful until he has first asked for forgiveness so does the indian believe that the waters of healing will turn to his injury if he does not use them in the right spirit would it not be well if we the superior race approached this good gift of god in like manner the natural simplicity of the indian at the baths also offers a good lesson to us instead of seeking for gaiety frivolity fashion and the means of pampering his appetite he goes to the baths of nature resolved upon quiet and restfulness as far as possible he seeks to prepare his mind beforehand that the physical means used will be beneficial in other words though he is a rude untutored savage so we say he has a clearer conception of the effect the mind has upon the body in real practical healing than has a large part of his civilized brothers and sisters as a rule we go to a physician or to a sanitarium or to baths i mean those of us who are sick and desire health first of all without any other thoughts than i am sick to go here may do me good i hope it will instead of preparing our minds beforehand by thoughtfulness getting ourselves into the proper mental attitude to be helped we leave it to chance to the surroundings to the doctor and thus often fail to get the benefit we might have received we carry our business cares our family worries our money getting with us and thus defeat the end for which we go nor is that all when we get there we want all the comforts of a home in other words we must be assured that we have a bedroom which we can lock up at night a bedstead with a mattress as soft and unhealthy as the ones we regularly sleep on stuffy closets where we can hang our clothes and the rest the indian finds his bedroom under the stars he puts the invalid flat on the ground a sheepskin perhaps between him and the earth but that is all when will the superior white race learn that rejuvenation of the body comes quicker to those who shed their civilization forswear their home comforts quit their indulgence in fixed-up dishes refrain from social frivolities commonly called duties and first and foremost 
after throwing away all the cares and worries that come of being so highly civilized get to a place where it is possible to sleep out of doors on the hard ground protected of course as the indians are get into the woods on to the hills down in the canyons out in the desert take a roll of blankets along and no matter what the weather learn to sleep on the bosom of mother earth out of doors and if the region is one near hot springs or mud baths all the better make it for the time being your home ah how wise is the indian in his choice of a home i have before referred to this but i cannot help writing of it again home it is not a place of unrest to him where it requires the labor of wife and daughter or a host of servants to keep it in order where polished furniture polished floors polished doors polished mirrors keep one forever with wiping cloth in hand removing the marks of careless fingers where bric-a-brac is accumulated and piled everywhere to the shattering of nerves if the children get near it or careless visitors happen to call where social demands are so great that children are relegated to the care of servants where brothers and sisters scarce have time to know each other and husbands and wives meet semi-occasionally no it is not a home of this kind to most indians everywhere is home provided there is a little shade water and grass for his burrow or pony in the mountains where he can shelter under an overhanging rock or in the forest where he has a roof of emerald supported by great pillars of pine or cottonwood or sycamore there is a home in the desert where the roof is millions of miles high decorated with suns and moons and stars and comets and meteors and milky way and countless nebulae and the walls are bounded on the east by the rising sun and on the west by the setting sun and god's own laboratories make new fresh pure air every moment there is home the san francisco disaster taught thousands of people the healthfulness of the outdoor life people who had been ailing for years puny children anemic youths and maidens dyspeptic parents all picked up appetite and health when compelled to live in the parks and on the streets let us heed the lesson let us follow the example of the indian and be more simple more natural let us relegate to the museum the collecting of curios and bric-a-brac and the thousand and one things that so crowd our houses as to make museums rather than homes of them i do not suppose it is necessary that i should say that in our civilization we cannot literally do as the indian does in this matter that is not my thought and what i would urge is that we live more simply and that like the indian we get out of doors more instead of housing ourselves the more as we become more civilized and that in the arrangement and accumulations of our home we make personal health comfort and happiness the most important considerations rather than display and to win the approval or envy of our neighbors but to return to the hot springs the indian has always used them he also learned and bequeathed to us the knowledge that mud is a useful therapeutic agent the yumas mojaves and others who live near the banks of the colorado river are in the habit of regularly plastering down their hair and scalp with thick black mud they go where it is clean and fresh washed down by the rushing waters of the mighty colorado through the great canyons and rubbing it well into their hair they cover it over with a cloth tied over the scalp and go on about their daily work they keep the hair thus covered with mud for a day or two and then wash it off and give the scalp a thorough cleansing 
what is the result whether the fact be a result from the use of the mud or not it is a fact that these river indians have long glossy black hair free from all disease and their scalps are as healthy as the hair they have no dandruff no falling out of the hair and do not need any hair tonic or dye the mud contains enough of the finely ground sand commingled with the softer silt to make a healthful mixture for gently exciting the scalp when the rubbing off and cleansing process takes place and covering the hair as well as the scalp with the mud and allowing it to dry on demands that the hair shall be well rubbed as well as the skin the effect is to clean the hair thoroughly and who knows but that the excitement generated by thus rubbing the hair as well as the scalp has something to do in promoting the healthful flow of the elements required for hair nutrition be that as it may i know the fact which is that these indians men as well as women have hair long black glossy reaching down to their waists and they attribute its healthfulness to the regular use of the mud-pack and rub. Now, while we may not care to pack the hair in mud, we can certainly utilize the idea. I have done so for years. I often give my scalp and hair a mud-bath, and it is both agreeable and exhilarating, and I had the assurance a few months ago from one of the leading scalp specialists of the East that my scalp was in an absolutely healthful condition, one of the very few found in such condition in the large eastern metropolis. The Indian also uses mud, and by this I mean the clear, pure, uncontaminated earth and sandy mixtures found in the rivers of the desert west for wounds. There is little doubt but that he learned this from the animals, who has not seen a dog, after a fight in which he got worsted, run and throw himself into a mud puddle? Many years ago, about twenty, I read an account of a battle between a wild cat and a dog, and the writer, who saw the conflict, told how the dog went and bathed himself in mud thereafter. The brief sketch made such an impression on me that I knew just where to find it, and I have hunted it up and am now going to copy it for the benefit of my readers. It will help explain why the Indian does the same thing. He has observed the animals bathing in the mud when wounded, as this dog did. The dog has won the battle, but he has got some ugly scars along his sides and flank. Observe that overheated as he is he does not rush into that clear stream he takes his bath in that shallow spring with a soft mud bottom note how he plasters himself laying the wounded side underneath and then sitting down on his haunches buries all the wounded parts in the ooze that mud has medicinal properties the dog knows it no physician could make so good a poultice for the wounds of a cat's claws as this dog has found for himself. Pray, if you have been clawed in that way by either feline or feminine, would you have found anything at the bottom of your book philosophy so remedial as this dog has found? The Indian's use of mud, therefore, is seen to be an inheritance as the result of his observation of the animals since the time i heard of the dog and wildcat fight i have had occasion to watch the indians many times i have used the mud with them and always with good results and if when some four and a half years ago i was bitten on the thumb by a rattlesnake and for a week was supposed to be hovering between life and death i had thought enough to have done as the indians do gone and put my hand and arm in a mud bath at the side of a stream or at the bottom of a shallow spring i should have fared as well as i did and perhaps better 
though I had two skilled physicians, an accomplished professor, and a devoted nurse to care for me. And when I was supposed to be well again, months afterward, I found that the deadly poison had in some way lodged in the lining of the stomach so that at times it would cause a nervous and muscular disturbance that made me suffer intense agony i then recalled the use of mud by my indian friends and i hied me away as speedily as i could to the hot mud baths of paso robles in california there the sulphur water at a temperature of over a hundred and ten degrees fahrenheit comes bubbling into a great wooden tank filled with the soft velvety mud black as ink of the tule marsh into this tank i stepped and gradually worked my way into the mud lying down in it and wriggling and working my body until i was as near covered as i could be i brought great armfuls of the hot soft and soothing nature poultice over my stomach and body and then lay there as long as it was wise to do so what mattered it that i was blacker than a negro when i came out two minutes with a bucket and a hose and i was cleaner than ever one week of these baths and i lost the poison never again to return i never think of paso robles and the mud baths there without a deep sense of gratitude that some of us at least have learned how to utilize some good things that the indian has taught us end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of what the white race may learn from the indian by george wharton james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen the indian and the sex question having studied medicine somewhat in my life i have been permitted as a medicine man to know more of the intimate life of the indian women than many white men in this article i propose to give the results of many observations in this field with full assurance that there are many things the white woman may learn from the indian both in her treatment of herself and her children in the first place the period of adolescence in both boys and girls is regarded with the importance it deserves the white race has much to learn from the indian in its treatment of boys and girls at this age my blood is made to boil almost every day when i am in our cities and see young girls just entering into maidenhood coming home from school anemic pale nervous irritable almost victims of st vitus's dance often dyspeptic or with a cough fastening its hold upon them because their parents are so blind and foolish as to prefer book and school education to health to me such parents are guilty of cruelty and criminality and i would sooner imprison them and take away the control of their children from them than i would the forger or the housebreaker they are cruel in that they are either ignorantly or willfully ruining the health perhaps for life of their children and they are criminal in that by so doing they are injuring the future welfare of the state boys too are treated exactly the same at this time as at any other and when the great mystery of sex awakening is upon them they are sent to school as usual treated with the same untrue answers to the questions that arise that they were given to quiet their minds when they were little more than babies i am thankful there has been much of an awakening in this matter during the past twenty years and that i have had an active part in it i think it was in eighteen eighty eight that i published a small book on sex teaching for the young it is as imperative to warn the young today as it was then the indian boy is instructed fully into the mystery of sex just as soon and as simply as he is in every other question that arises and at puberty he is made the subject of specific ceremonies that teach him the meaning of the change that is coming over him he is treated with a new dignity 
is formally recognized as having entered man's estate and is sent out into the woods or the solitude of the desert to come to himself in the case of girls ceremonies of instruction purification and dedication are almost universally observed the adolescent is set apart from her fellows and the elder women give her definite and full instructions as to what the change that is taking place in her life means she is shown the importance of the new function and how much the welfare of the race depends upon it then she is made to undergo ceremonies that last for several days in which her body and all its functions are dedicated to the tribe she is one of the future mothers now and as such is entitled to all respect and consideration there is no foolish reserve no modesty so called which arrogates to itself the right to criticize the wisdom of god in creating human beings male and female that they may marry and propagate their kind upon the earth for wherever one finds the sort of modesty that is ashamed of natural and god-given functions there is either a mental perversion for which the victim is to be pitied or a moral perversion which is to be reprobated every indian girl is given fully to understand what the function means with all its possibilities and she is taught to pray that when the time comes she may have a lover and that he may be a good husband and that in due time she may be the happy and healthy mother of many happy and healthy children and in some tribes there are certain shrines where the girls are taught to go and offer their prayers that lovers husbands and children not one or two of the latter but many may be given to them at the will of the gods above this is to dignify sex to train the girls that wifehood and motherhood are holy and to be desired and that they are not matters merely to jest and joke about or to talk in secret whispers about one to another as if the very subject were unholy and unclean then a matter of practical healthfulness is observed that white parents need very much to learn it appears to me especially in this age of scholastic crowding and mental overworking each month the girl is required to rest in order that she may preserve and maintain her body in perfectly healthy condition she may go where she will but she must be quiet and still in order that the function may not be disturbed and that its regularity may be established not only this but this habit of rest is kept up so long as the function continues through life even on the march a woman may stay behind if she so desires and rest for a day or so the result of this rest at such times is shown in the strength and vigor the women show during pregnancy and at birth they seem to store up strength and as i shall later show childbirth to most of them is no more a time of peril pain or distress than is breathing mothers who neglect to thus instruct and care for their daughters at the adolescent period are criminals both to their children and to the race among the ancient greeks such a mother would have been regarded as a monstrosity yet many mothers have confessed to their physicians they have never had one word of converse with their daughters upon this most important subject when i see children going to school at this adolescent period and being forced by our competitive system of education to strain every nerve to cram the required amount of facts into their brains i do not wonder that we have so many sickly women who are incapable of being the mothers of healthy and happy children far better that our children be not educated in chemistry and literature in physical science and art than that they unfit themselves for the happy relations of a beautiful marriage and sweet and tender parenthood for let the new or the old woman say what she will 
the divinely ordered plan is that women shall be wives and happy wives at that capable of making their husbands happy or at least of contributing their share to that end and also that they shall know the joys of maternity unhappy indeed is that woman whose physical condition is such that she refuses to know the sweet touch of her own baby's body and denies herself the blessed privilege of training its soul for a beautiful and useful life the indian mother sees to it that her daughter is early taught her future possibilities and the will of those above in regard to her and the growing woman would as soon shirk the responsibilities of her sex as she would refuse to eat the consequences are that normal births with indian women are practically painless and entirely free from danger i have known a woman to deliver herself of her child sever the umbilicus and then walk half a mile to the creek walk into it with the baby and give herself and the child a good washing then return to her camp suckle the little one and proceed to attend to her duties as if nothing had happened at another time i saw a woman less than half an hour after her child was born start off for a heavy load of wood their freedom from constructing waistbands their absolute freedom of body their nasal and deep breathing their muscular exercise through life their open-air sleeping and living all have much to do with these easy births to a good indian woman also there is nothing more evil than to circumvent the will of those above by refusing to have children such a woman would be almost a monstrosity to an indian who would be unable to comprehend the mental workings of such an abnormality children are to be desired to be longed for and to become a joyous possession in the making of some of their basketry the Paiute women weave a design which shows the opening between the upper and lower worlds through which the souls of all children born into this upper world must come by a correspondence of the symbol with the thing symbolized the Paiute weaver believes that if she closes up this opening in the basket she will render herself incapable of bearing any more children therefore even though you were to offer her her weight in money you could not persuade her to close up the aperture in the basket's design this would be circumventing the will of the gods the same law too applies to the suckling of her child the indian mother never dreams of foregoing this healthful duty and pleasure she regards it as one of her special joys in which she is superior to man and just as the Paiute weaver refuses to close the aperture in her basket so does the zuni woman refuse to close except with averted eyes and a prayer that the gods will see she did it with unseeing eyes the tiny aperture in the mammy of the water bottles which she makes of clay in imitation of the human breasts she dare not even thus in symbol suggest the closing of her own maternal founts ah beautiful simplicity and joy of naturalness the god of men and women surely knew what was good for them when he set in motion the forces that created them in harmony with his will and purpose we are healthy happy normal beings living lives of purity progress and peace in opposition to his will we are unhealthy unhappy abnormal beings full of wretchedness impurity and misery in many things the indian too simple to go far away from the divine precepts which come to him through contact with nature is wiser than we let us then put on the garment of simplicity seek to know the will of god and with hearts like little children learn the true way and then seek for courage to walk therein end of chapter fifteen
Chapter Sixteen of What the White Race May Learn from the Indian by George Wharton James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen The Indian and Her Baby. I have elsewhere spoken of the Indian woman's reception of her child. It is welcomed with joy, and yet in its first hour's treatment most white women would think its life would terminate. After seeing that it breathes properly, that is, through the nose, the mother carries her little one to the nearest creek or water hole and gives it a good bath. Cold water has no terrors for her, and she does not fear its use for the child. With this cold bath the child may be said to enter its earthly existence. Henceforth, life is to be a succession of hardening processes. Indian babies get no foolish and weakening coddling. They are loved dearly and petted often, but are made to lie down on flat boards or basket cradles, with arms and legs strapped down, and are thus early accustomed to physical restraint. They sleep out of doors from the day of their birth, and become accustomed to all kinds of weather. For an Indian child who has taken cold, we shall look in vain. The name, the thought of such an ill, is unknown. If the parents have to move from canyon up to plateau, or go off to faraway forests for the winter's supply of pinion nuts, the child is put into its carrying basket, swung on the back of the mother, dependent from her forehead, and carried either on horseback or on foot to the new stopping place. Simplicity and naturalness accompany every stage of the little one's life until the age of puberty, when the child life is supposed to end and the man or woman life begins. Now, while of very necessity our method of treating white children must be different from this, we can learn many lessons from the Indian that will materially benefit our race. The keystone of the whole idea is found in the words, No Coddling. Not long ago I went to the home of an artist friend. His wife had just presented him with a fine, healthy son. The wife's mother was present and had taken charge of the young mother and her baby. The room was stifling hot so that I could scarcely breathe, and when I went to see the baby it was wrapped up in a cradle with a sheet and three blankets over its head. At once I opened the doors and windows, taking good precaution to see that the mother did not take cold. I gave both grandmother and new mother a lecture upon the monstrous folly and cruelty of thus depriving the newborn child of needed air for its expanding lungs. The lesson was accepted in the proper spirit, for the father fully agreed with me, and on the grandmother's departure a few days later, the coddling, smothering process ceased, and a cold bath, sleeping out of doors, and a generally healthy treatment of the child substituted. I know this is an exaggerated case, but it serves as an illustration of the wrongful and excessive coddling we give our children, from which follow such evils as weak lungs, weak throats, readiness to take cold, etc. As the exaggerated opposite of this, let me relate the treatment I accorded to my own children. When my first son was born, we were so located that I was compelled to be both physician and nurse. His first experience, after a good hot bath, was a cold bath, and within half an hour of his birth he was sleeping out of doors. At five weeks of age he and his mother accompanied me on an 800-mile drive over the plains and deserts of Nevada. We camped out slept on the ground, and gave him, whenever possible, an open-air bath in the cold mountain brooks that occasionally were met with. A year or so after the second boy was born, I was stationed in the little town of Cedarville, California, 
and one of the happiest remembrances of my life there was in winter when the snow was deep upon the ground. I would place a canvas upon the floor of my small study, where a good fire blazed in the stove, fetch in a couple of wash-tubs full of snow, then undress the youngsters and watch them as they sat in the snow, rubbed it on their naked bodies, and laughed and shouted and crowed with delight when I gently snowballed them. While they were little tots, every morning before being dressed, they stood outside while I threw, not poured but threw, a bucketful of cold water over them. Then, after a vigorous and hearty rub-down, they went with me for a walk where they were allowed to run and jump and romp to their heart's content. This I call a rational treatment of children. It certainly is a healthy treatment, and those brought up under such an Indian method will never know the aches, pains, ills, and weaknesses that most white children are afflicted with. And I would treat my baby girls, if I had any, exactly the same as my boys, for the health of the race more nearly depends upon the health of the future mothers than upon that of the future fathers. If it be thought that I am too extreme, I quote an article entire from a recent Good Health, entitled Strenuous Health Culture, in which it will be seen that others have done the same thing with equally good results. Time was when clothing, sumptuous or for use, save their own painted skins, our sires had none. Yet they were far healthier and hardier than the present much-clad generation. Why does the savage go naked with impunity while the civilized man shivers in his clothes? and is a prey to colds, pneumonia, and a variety of diseases unknown to the naked savage. One of the marvels of the normal human body is its wonderful adaptability, the maintenance of its equilibrium under constantly varying conditions. By the regulation and adaptation of the heat functions of the body, the bodily temperature is maintained at the normal standard in spite of the changing temperature of the surrounding atmosphere. But when the body is artificially heated continually, as by overclothing and overheated rooms, its functions become to some degree dormant, and in consequence the natural bodily resistance is greatly lessened. The effort of the body to resist cold stimulates and strengthens. One who can resist cold can resist all kinds of disease germs. This has been demonstrated by the success of the cold air cure for a variety of diseases. The old-time coddling of delicate children, which still further lessened their vitality and weakened their powers of endurance, is now giving place to its opposite. Judicious exposure to cold has been found to be one of the best methods of strengthening weak infants and developing healthy children. At a recent conference of mothers held in Minnesota, they were advised that a snowbank makes one of the best cradles. One mother who had tried this treatment thought that it accounted for the unusual health and strength of the family. A Milwaukee physician, Dr. John E. Warden, has adopted this strenuous treatment to prepare his babes for the rigors of life, and up to the present his methods have been abundantly justified by their success. His little daughters, Shirley and Jane, aged respectively eight and three years, are two of the firmest and healthiest bits of humanity to whom disease of all kinds is unknown. During the cold weather, these children may be seen barefooted and bareheaded, clad only in their cotton garments, thoroughly enjoying a romp in the snowdrifts, and without even a goose pimple on their skin. "'We are merely following out health rules,' said Dr. Warden, speaking of his unique methods of bringing up his children. "'We are aiming at prevention rather than at cure. We have brought the children up so that they are fearless.' and dread neither the ice-cold plunge 
nor a romp in the snow in their bare feet. The door is always open, and they go out when they like and return when they are ready to do so. We do not force the children to go out in the snow barefooted. They go out of their own free will, and play until they are tired or their attention is called to something else. In the summer we send them out into the sun bareheaded and barefooted, with orders to keep out of the shade. On the street cars they are instructed to sit on the sunny side of the car. It is well that they experience something of contrast. Therefore, a cold bath is given them daily in the warm weather. In the winter they are allowed to go outdoors to get stimulus from the cold air. Children brought up like tender hothouse plants are likely to contract colds and other diseases and to die as the result of not having robust constitutions. These children, on the contrary, will and do escape without any sickness, and should they get sick their recovery is almost certain because of their being strong and in good condition. Both Dr. Warden and his wife are graduates of the University of Michigan, and Mrs. Warden was, for a number of years before her marriage, a trained nurse. During my hospital training and institutional work, says Mrs. Warden, I saw so much sickness due to weakened bodies that I investigated causes and came to the conclusion that much of the weakness was due to a lack of physical development to abuses through mistaken kindness on the part of the parents that so weakened the immature bodies that they could not withstand the attack of disease. With our children, beginning from babyhood, we have had one aim, and that is to give them strong physiques, and we have succeeded thus far. They have never had one drop of medicine and never been ill one moment. The clothing of these children is always light, and much the same summer and winter. It is of cotton almost exclusively, and no bands are ever used. In the place of stockings, the easy, sensible, comfortable Roman sandal, made only in England, is worn. We believe in clothing them as lightly as possible, says Mrs. Warden depending on their excellent heat-making organs to develop any extra warmth needed in an emergency. This stimulates a necessity for a good, strong, internal circulation of the fluids of the body and creates a desire to exercise a little in order to keep warm. Overwarm children are usually lazy. The warden home is sunny and bright with windows wide open day and night and the rooms kept always cool and fresh. No useless furniture, no bric-a-brac, no draperies, harbor dust and germs. The walls and hardwood floors and few articles of furniture are kept scrupulously clean, but without ornament. The whole house is given over to the children, and there is no need for prohibitions of any sort. Concerning the diet of his children, Dr. Warden says, No national or international problems concerning the welfare of our people are as important as our food problem. And yet it is a very simple one, solved by an all-wise creator before the creation of man. Time enough is wasted in the kitchen of our modern homes, spoiling good food by making almost impossible mixtures, and then overcooking these to do all the necessary work of any nation. This careless and ignorant diet leads to ill health, from which there is no escape unless we learn to lead a sensible life, eating moderately of natural foods, and these in simple combinations. With our children very little cow's milk is used, largely because of its unreliability in the city but we do not favor an abundance of milk anyway, after children have teeth to use on their food. Their diet consists of fruits, cereals, nuts, and vegetables, no spices, vinegar, etc. being used. Whole wheat flour, the bran included, is used exclusively. They are never urged to eat. 
we expect them to know whether they are hungry or not. Urging children to eat leads to overfilling of the stomach, and this to bowel disorders, and often death. Next to urging children to eat as a cause of overeating is variety. We never supply them with a choice of foods at one meal. The diet for each meal is simple, and yet in one season or year they get quite a variety, as exampled by a list of the fruits they get, one kind at a time. Apples, pears, grapes, plums, cherries, oranges, pineapples, peaches, grapefruit, prunes, apricots, figs, dates, raisins, bananas, melons, and the numerous kinds of berries, all choice fruit. They scorn anything with a bad spot as being not fit to eat. Then again we buy them lots of nuts for food, not just for the fun of cracking and eating and usually overeating. They get nut food as a United States soldier his rations. Next we have an immense choice of vegetables, of which they get one kind at a meal, never two vegetables to one child at the same meal. On such a diet it is no occasion for surprise that they have never been sick. The good health to be derived from a simple meal more than repays for any fancied abstinence. The warden children are already little athletes. The elder girl is the youngest basketball player in Milwaukee. Every evening they exercise for a few minutes nude, incidentally getting an air bath to the skin of the whole body while developing and strengthening the muscles. Dr. and Mrs. Warden are not faddists. They are earnestly and steadfastly endeavoring to fulfill the trust committed to them, to develop their children into strong, healthy women, to strengthen their powers of endurance, and develop their physical faculties by bringing them up in accordance with all the laws of health. Another thing that I would have white women learn from their Indian sisters is a thing they used to know but are rapidly forgetting that is the joy of suckling their own children an indian mother that does not suckle her own child is almost unknown with the superior classes of the white race it is the opposite of this proposition that is true not only is this of great injury to the child but it is fraught with most serious consequences to the mother is it nothing that the mother of a child willfully puts away from herself all the little fond, sweet intimacies that naturally grow out of this relationship, the joy and exercise of a natural and beautiful function, the feeling that the baby life is still being sustained by the mother's own life-blood transmitted by mother love and mother processes into sweet, delicious food that nothing else can equal? It is a fact that all the higher affections and emotions of the human soul have to be cultivated and developed. The child sees little or no beauty in a sunset. It must be trained to recognize it. The love of nature grows as we cultivate it. The nobler emotions of self-sacrifice, humility, kindliness grow as we cultivate them, and while where maternity is a perfectly natural process, joy accompanies it in all its manifestations, there is no denying the fact that in our so-called civilization women have to cultivate the feelings connected with the function to bring to themselves the joy they should normally possess. But that there is a joy in suckling one's own child many, many mothers, true mothers, have assured me and I wish to add my voice to the supplications of the innocent child that every mother give of her own sweet loving breast to the child she has brought into the world. Some mothers refuse because it destroys the beautiful contour of the bust, others because it demands too close confinement and would therefore prohibit regular attendance upon club or social functions. Poor women! bartering their god-given rights and privileges 
for the messes of pottage that society and club life afford that is afford to mothers at the time they should be with their babes can any society on earth any club that ever existed compensate for the loss of healthful nutrition given from a loving mother's breast let the statistics of bottle-fed babies attest the dangers that accrue from the mother's refusal or inability for which she is to be pitied rather than condemned to suckle her own young end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of what the white race may learn from the indian by george wharton james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen the indian and the sanctity of nudity while adults of both sexes among all indians wear either a skirt or a g-string there is not the slightest hesitancy in allowing the young both boys and girls to run about in a state of nudity since we have sent white teachers and missionaries to the indians they are beginning to learn that somehow though they can't sort it out just how or why there is something indecent in allowing nude children to wander about their homes and villages they are being taught to be ashamed their children are becoming sex conscious as are our white children long before their time and we are foisting on to them our hateful impure and blasphemous conception of nudity for myself i am free to confess that i have no sympathy with this kind of teaching i think it unnecessary and not only unnecessary but a positive injury i believe in the sanctity of nudity especially in that of young children and while with our present social customs we cannot allow our children to be nude or partially nude in public i would that our minds were as clean in this matter as are those of the indians with whom i have so long been acquainted whatever society may demand of us in public there is no reason why in private both our children and ourselves should not spend a certain portion of every day if possible in contact with the direct rays of the sun and the air every school in the land should be so equipped and our children and their parents be so trained that under proper direction a certain part of every day the students should be so exposed all know the benefit that comes from the exposing of the arms and legs to the sun and breezes at the seashore men women and children alike who flee the city for an annual holiday to the seaside return to their shut-in civilized life with renewed vigor and health why not give some of this life to city children every day in the year even in eastern cities in winter a solarium could be created in the top stories of the schoolhouses and there with every window wide open the children clothed in the scantiest of garments as at the seaside could go through physical and breathing exercises and romp or play games for half an hour to their great benefit both of body and mind we have for so long trained ourselves to the half-expressed belief that there is something wrong about nudity that we find women's clubs draping statues and organizations rejecting figures because they are nude which all ages and all civilized people have accepted as pure and chaste works of art i would not for a moment have it thought that i approve of all nude statues or pictures many of them have no virtue to commend them yet i would not indiscriminately condemn all works of art in the nude merely because they are nude we have forgotten the appearance of a healthy body and feel ashamed to see one by our mental attitude we accuse the creator of indecency that male and female created he them for not only do we veil the bodies of the opposite sexes from each other which is a perfectly correct and wise thing to do 
but daughters are ashamed to be seen nude by their own mothers and mothers by their daughters i believe in the sanctity of nudity let the sexes remain apart by all means but let there be less of false shame when men see nude men or women see nude women or either or both see nude children it is a fact declared by the most conservative of white explorers that the naked tribes of aborigines are the most pure chaste and truly modest our conception that because indians are unclothed they are therefore indecent and unclean impure and unchaste is a dirty conception dishonoring to ourselves and our creator on y soit qui mal y pense and to the pure all things are pure are as true today as when they were first spoken and written and while i am as opposed as is any one living to nude pictures and statues that have nothing to commend them but their nudity while i am strongly opposed to the promiscuous nudity either in whole or in part i am equally opposed to the mental attitude that nudity in itself is wrong and that the creator did not know his business when he created us both nude and of different sexes benjamin franklin john quincy adams and many others of the great men of the world made it a daily practice to expose their bodies to the sun and the air for years i have seized every proper opportunity to do so such as when i took my fifteen days rowing trip down the colorado river when on the salton sea exploring trip when out in the deserts the canyons the forests on the mountain tops i endeavored every day to give my body some exposure and every night and morning when camping out before retiring and arising i have a brief air bath sometimes with vigorous physical exercises thus the power of god's own sun and air enter my body through every pore of the skin and i enjoy a health vigor vim and tingle of delight i can get in no other way when i first visited the avusapai indians all the men were nude part of the time save for the breech clout in their dances in some of which i participated it was a delight to see the movements of their perfect muscles their bronze flesh glistening in the sun or in the glow of the campfires and men women and children all bathed at the same time in the clear waters of avasu creek all the adults of course wearing either a short skirt or a breech clout but the major part of the body fully exposed there was no immodesty and no thought of anything of the kind nudity or semi-nudity was taken as a matter of course and neither by word or deed did any one seem conscious of it after vigorous swimming the young men wrestled the youngsters ran races the men indulged in various games their bodies still exposed to the sun and the air and no one could fail to observe the health vigor and robustness that came from this habit of life the hopis train their boys and young men to their morning runs over the desert in a state of almost complete nudity and in their snake dance races nothing but the g-string is worn and people of both sexes gaze upon them with no thoughts of immodesty modesty is a condition of soul and has nothing to do with the exposure of covering of the body one may be a godiva and be far more modest than another who veils not only her whole body but even her face and for myself i wish to record my conviction that it would be far better for the morals of civilized man if he would bring up his children of both sexes to recognize and know the sanctity of nudity rather than to cover the body as he does and to affirm by his words and suggest by his demeanor that he regards an exposed body as indecent a small trunk can always be worn 
and this suffices for every purpose of true modesty. In many of the leading sanitariums of the world, the patients are required to expose their bodies to the sun and air for a certain length of time daily. Here is a struggling to get back to a natural condition, an almost essential condition to the attainment and retention of perfect health. Of the outdoor gymnasiums for men and women at the Boulder Sanitarium, Colorado, Dr. Howard F. Rand thus writes, Here the men patients, clothed with simple trunks, bask in the sunshine on the sand which covers the ground, follow the trainer through the different lines of gymnastic work, finally plunging into the pool and coming out ready to be dried and thoroughly rubbed. Donning their simple apparel, they can, if they choose, proceed up the mountain and gather beautiful wild flowers and rest the eye on the surrounding scenery. The outdoor gymnasium is especially helpful in the treatment of women. It is very difficult to get them to dress properly when taking physical exercise, and they are so afraid of exposing themselves to the sunlight and ruining their complexion. But the beautiful physique of some of our young women who have trained in this line, and the assurance that they can so develop themselves, lead them to make short trips to the gymnasium, and gradually they grow willing to be delivered from close wrappings, and expose themselves to the sunlight. The pleasure is enticing. Enjoyment of exercise in this place, without the restriction of tight clothing, rapidly increases and desired results are obtained by this means in less time than in any other line of training. The great essential is to have the person in natural condition when exercising, so that all the organs of the body may move freely and naturally, without let or hindrance. Number seems to increase the enchantment, hence the more readily do the timid and backward take the first steps. At first it is impossible for many to expand at the waistline, but a jump into the pool, the temperature of the water being seventy to seventy-five degrees, causes them involuntarily to inflate the respiratory organs, and through this and special training deep breathing becomes habitual in less time than it would in any other way. We aim to have our patients spend at least one hour twice a day forenoon and afternoon, in the open-air gymnasium. Soon after beginning this course, the patient's skin, and mind as well, will be found clearing up. He will say his appetite is better, and that he sleeps more soundly, and is gaining weight and strength. The surface becomes brown in a short time, but as soon as pigmentation ceases, there is a natural pearly white hue, a sure indicator of health. These open-air gymnasiums are to be found at the leading sanitariums of the world, thus clearly showing that the Indian idea of nudity has the sanction of the highest and wisest medical opinions of the white race. The body is a sweet, a precious, a beautiful expression of God's thought, it was and is intended by the divine as the house of the mind, the soul, the immortal part of the human being. Paul expressly declares it is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Every part of it is beautiful, every part God-given. In health it is the most perfect machine ever designed, and the most beautiful. Every function it performs is a marvel, every power contained within it a miracle. How obviously wrong, then, is anything that disparages, lowers, offends the high and supreme dignity of this glorious structure? Yet we are ashamed of it, we apologize for it. We teach our children to be ashamed of it and to cover it as an evil thing. End of chapter 17
Chapter 18 of What the White Race May Learn from the Indian by George Wharton James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 The Indian and Frankness. Another thing the white race might learn from the Indian, and it would be well for them if they did, is the virtue of frankness. If an Indian likes you or dislikes you, he lets you know. There is no pretense, no hypocrisy, and in his speech he indicates his feelings. Then, too, he is not offended by plain speech. If he lies and you tell him so, he honors you, and if you lie, he will not hesitate to say so. Making the fingers of both hands as a tongue on each side of the mouth, he says, "'You talk two ways at once.' which is Indian, for our ruder vernacular, you are a liar. There are no conventional lies among Indians. They do not speak untruths for the sake of politeness. They have learned the lesson of the man of Galilee, who two thousand years ago taught, Let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Of course, there are untruthful Indians, but with the major part their word is never broken. I would just as soon take the simple word of most of the Indians I know as that of the most upright and honored of the old-fashioned southern gentlemen. And I would no more think of insulting the Indian by putting his integrity and in speech on the same plane as that of the ordinary society or business man or woman of America than I would insult the lion by calling him a wolf. Strong words, but true, and capable of demonstration. Too often Indians who come in contact with the whites learn to lie, but the pure, uncontaminated, uncivilized Indian hates a lie and a liar as much as the proverb says the devil hates holy water. I shall never forget the impression made in the courtroom at Flagstaff, Arizona, when Big Weotan, a Navajo Indian, who had been charged with murder, and who had sent word to the sheriff that it would be useless to hunt for him, as he could never be found, but that, if he was wanted, he would come in when the trial began. I say, I shall never forget the marvelous impression caused by the proud stalking into the courtroom of this old and dignified Indian, and his speech to the judge, Though I am sore wounded, and the journey over the desert has been dreary and long, and has well nigh killed me, I gave my word that I would be here, the word of a Navajo that never was broken, so here I am. Do with me as you will, so that you do honestly. Several times, with perfect confidence, I have risked my life in exploring trips on the mere word of an Indian that he would be at such a place at a certain time with food and water. And such has been my experience that now I never hesitate to accept the simple word of any Indian who has an ordinarily good reputation. I have often had powwows with various tribes, and whatever they have promised me in such councils has invariably been performed. And yet there is a peculiar twist to the mentality of many Indians that need comment here. When a stranger is questioning an Indian about anything that she or he deems of no great importance, as, for instance, the meaning of a certain design on a basket, the Indian conception of politeness leads her to give you the reply your question seems to call for. For instance, if you see a zigzag design on a basket and you ask her, Is this to represent lightning? She thinks that is what you want it to represent, so she says, Yes. Ten minutes later, and her questioner asks, Is this the ripple of the sunshine on water? Again, with the same thought uppermost in her mind, that she must be polite to her questioner, that that is the answer asked for, she says, yes. And so on, with a dozen different questioners, 
and all of them with a different interpretation of the same symbol her answer would be yes every time this however is not untruth it is because the white questioner does not know that his is not the method of extracting truth from an indian he has asked for a certain answer and he has it end of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of What the White Race May Learn from the Indian by George Wharton James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 The Indian and Repining. In all my association with Indians, I cannot recall a single instance of repining, regret over the unalterable events of the past weeping or wailing over joys lost demoralizing self-pity or magnified distress because we have seen better days the simple unpretentious really democratic life of the indian disposes of these latter ills to which the white race is heir by rendering them impossible and repining and self-pity seem to have no place in their vocabulary they weep and wail when their loved ones die, and they gather together and pray if drought or other natural evils destroy their crops, but when the weeping is done, it is done, and life's duties are taken up without constant repining or self-pity. What has happened has happened. Nothing can alter it. It is the will of those above, or whether it is or not, it is, and that is enough. Hence, why complain? Why protest? Accept the inevitable. Leave it alone. Let the dead past bury its dead. Do the work of today, never mind the woe of yesterday. This seems to me to be the Indian attitude. A kind of proud acquiescence, a manly, womanly recognition of facts, and a willingness to face them and thus triumph over them instead of magnifying their sorrows they minimize them by constant labor and by doing the very opposite viz magnifying their joys often i have heard this done a widow speaking of her lost husband and immediately referring in tones of joy to her boys and girls her fine cornfield her peach orchard her blessings in fact it is simply impossible for anyone to estimate the amount of time, strength, energy, and life that have been wasted by the white race in lamenting, repining, weeping over things that could neither be helped nor changed. And how absurd such lamentation is! If an evil can be remedied, remedy it. If a wrong can be righted, right it but to waste valuable time strength and energy in vain repining and self-pity is a crime that no indian is so foolish as to commit it is left to the white race to thus show its superiority this comes from two or three causes first our race mainly our women are not as healthy physically as the indian and where physical health is lacking it is so easy to yield to the force of evil circumstance. Strong men or women can force themselves into physical and mental activity, and these bring solace and forgetfulness of the pains, ills, and sorrows of the past. Second, the very easy and luxury of our lives, which all white people so much covet, give us time and opportunity to sit down and study over sources of sadness while on the other hand the indian woman has her daily work that she must perform willy-nilly and thus is kept from the contemplation of her sorrows third there is in the indian that calm serenity of mind and soul that belong only to either very childlike or exceedingly cultured natures with the indian it is childlike acceptance of the will of the gods with browning it was the calm philosophy of the highest culture unfortunately for most of us 
we have lost the religious simplicity of our ancestors, our childlike faith and trust, and have not yet attained to the serenity of the philosopher. I write this brief chapter merely to call attention to the facts and to urge upon the white race the necessity, if it would preserve its serenity, of either reverting to the simple faith of the Indian or of cultivating a religious philosophy that will produce an equal serenity and equanimity in the face of trial, sorrow, misfortune, or death. End of chapter 19